All right. Good morning, everybody. Again, I'm Vicki Reck. I work with the Wien Shemp Haynes and Moore Law Firm. I'm a client care coordinator, and I've been helping people um, get on VA aided attendance benefits and Medicaid for nursing home for almost 20 years now. So I wanted to come today and kind of talk about, you know, when you uh, come into this situation and you need some help paying for assisted living, for sitters in the home, or for nursing home care, we want to look at some government benefits and to see how people can qualify for that. So I have provided some handouts, this one being the first one. Um, <coughs> on the right side of your sheet is the Veterans Administration Aided Attendance Pension, and then on the left side of the sheet is the Medicaid for long-term care for nursing home. So I thought um, what we do today is just kind of go through those, give you some information about the pension levels and how to qualify for those. So for the VA aided attendance pension, um, the veteran needed to serve at least 90 consecutive days active duty being during a time of war. Okay, so the next page that you've got is the war periods for the non-service connected pensions. And that will give you an idea if, if your loved one, you know, um, imagine this age group, we're looking at people that have been in Korea and Vietnam, unless you're here about your grandparents, which would probably be World War II. Um, anyway, so if a veteran has served at least 90 consecutive days, one of those being during one of these eligible time periods, then that's the first qualifier for this particular pension. This pension is not based on a service-related disability. It's related to just having been an active duty service member and honorably discharged. So it's a little bit different. So your disability doesn't have to be related to Agent Orange or um, boots on the ground in Vietnam or anything, um, any kind of stroke or uh, heart attack on the job in the military, but this is just being over the age of 65 and having a disability, okay? So that's the first qualifier. The next thing is the veteran had to have been honorably discharged or a medical discharge. Um, if someone was dishonorably discharged, they typically don't receive any kind of veterans benefits, okay? Um, you do not need to be receiving current care at the VA Medical Center or any you know, VA physicians here locally. It's a benefit that's available for anybody, so you can have any kind of health care, okay? Um, Next would be that the veteran, if it's the veteran that you're applying for, um, some of the qualifications are on that right side of the table. Um, at the time that a person qualifies, they need to require assistance in activities of daily living. So it's kind of um, typical of a long-term care insurance, so it's similar to that. So the VA says, you know, to deem you as disabled for this particular pension, you would need to have assistance in at least two activities of daily living. And those activities would be bathing, dressing, toileting, transfers, mobility, incontinence care, okay? Or another kind of segue into that is the other um, line is having a cognitive impairment that requires 24 hour supervision. So as you know, because you've been coping with um, Alzheimer's and dementia for years, you know that a person might be able to do all their bathing. They may be able to do all their dressing. They may be completely mobile, but because of their cognitive impairment, you have to tell them, you have to facilitate, let's get in the shower. Oh, I just showered. They don't change their clothes. You know, they need that supervision. They can't cook. Um, it's dangerous putting the pot on the stove. You start burning things, right? So um, VA says if they don't have a deficit in two of those five ADLs, but they need that 24 hour care for safety in their environment, that's another route that they could take for this aid and attendance pension. And that simply would be another piece of paper that a physician has to sign for that. So, um, so that's a qualification for a veteran. Widows also can be qualified for this pension at a different level. Um, your veteran, if you look kind of at the fourth box down there, this talks about the 2024 maximum pension rates. A single veteran could be eligible for up to $2,300 a month to help pay for assisted living, sitter care, nursing home care. A married veteran, so if there's a couple together, that um, pension rate maximum would be $2,727 a month. So for instance, um, I'll pick up on the gentleman in the back, if you're a veteran, and your wife is the one with the with the disability, 
then um, you would submit medical records for her. You're still the claimant, but as long as her medical expenses um, uh, kind of outweigh what your income is each month, then you know VA will qualify for you you for a married veteran income level. Okay, so just because you're 100% able-bodied doesn't mean that your wife's medical expenses can't help you know qualify you for this pension. Okay. Um, and then a widow, if you're a widow of a veteran and not remarried okay, and not divorced, then that widow could qualify for up to $1,478 a month. So if you're looking at your mother, grandmother, or you yourself, um, and even, you know, sometimes we have female veterans, you know, there's people that were in the WAC and different, you know, the waves, different um, methods of being into the, into the wars, um, they would actually be on, under the single veteran or married veteran rate. And every once in a while we have a married veteran, married veteran to veteran. So that bottom is the 36.49 a month if there's two veterans that qualify. Okay. So what does um, what does VA say about what your assets are? So it's an income based and an asset based pension. So the first was a qualification for being in the military, and then what they look at is they say, well, certain things are exempt. We're not going to count these things as part of your asset level, and those things are your house. Um, with up to two acres and also if you're living in the house or you intend to return to it if you're in a temporarily in a facility. One vehicle per household is exempt. It's not even reported on your application. Up to $10,000 of um, burial or life insurance is exempt. <clears throat> and then also any of your household goods and personal effects, they don't come to your house in inventory, all the stuff that you have laying around. <laughs> okay, so those are exempt. They're not countable. So for 2024, the asset limits are um, for a single or married couple, it's that next line, $155,356. So that would be, they look at any of your checking accounts, savings accounts, brokerage, IRAs, any of that stuff. Or if you have property that's not connected to your home or your homestead, then they would look at that you know, separately as part of your assets, okay? So if someone was wanting to apply for this, say they have sitters at home and um, basically it's using all their income each month, their asset limit this year would have to be under that 155,000 to qualify, okay? Um, and they have this kind of crazy calculation that the asset limit, they take the sum of your assets and then your annual gross income, and then they take out your annual medical expenses. So it's a little bit, crazy how they calculate those things. But if I look at it backwards, if I say, okay, if my income is totally depleted by month, my monthly medical expenses, my sitter, my assisted living or whatever, then I know if my assets are lower than 155,000 with my income being completely depleted by my medical expenses, then I know I qualify. Say my income is $2,000 a month and my medical expenses are 3,000 a month and my assets are $150,000. Well, I'm in the hole each month, right? I'm having to pull out of my savings, so then I know I qualify. Say my income is 3,000 and my medical expenses are 2,000. That's when you get to this crazy calculation because <laughs> they're like, okay, well, you kind of still have $1,000 net left, you know, once you pay your sitters. So let's see how much you have in your assets to be able to help with that. So that's when it's kind of helpful to, to meet with someone that does these calculations to kind of figure out, okay, am I eligible or am I not eligible, okay? Um, the next thing on that is in 2018, uh, the Veterans Administration implemented what's called a, um, a look back period. So you all may have heard of you know, Medicaid. Medicaid for nursery home care has a five year look back. They say if you have, if you have transferred any assets <clears throat> and then applied for Medicaid within the five years of transferring, they're not gonna pay for your care for a while. So VA said, well, that's a good idea because we have so many people applying for this and they've been you know, transferring assets and then applying for this and getting on the benefit the next day, right? So they said, well, we're gonna implement a three-year look back. So they say, if you transfer any assets to your relatives for safekeeping, or if you've done some Medicaid planning thinking, gosh, I'm gonna be nursing home here in the next five, six, seven, or eight years, I'm gonna move some assets, and then you learn about the VA benefit, it's like, oh, well, yeah, I just transferred stuff two years ago. Well, they say, well, we can't qualify you until three years has expired from that gift. So when we look at planning for people, um, we look at, you know, a new diagnosis is a good time to come in and meet with an elder law attorney 
to figure out, okay, you know, a new diagnosis doesn't mean we're going in the nursing home tomorrow, right? Or we don't need assisted living care tomorrow. Sometimes it does mean that, but usually we have enough time, a window of time that we can say, okay, well, let's get our assets in order. Let's get our legal documents in order so we have all the things we need to take care of our elder, you know, until they die, right? Um, so we also want to look at the assets. How are we going to pay for our care if we don't have long-term care insurance? So that's when we're like, okay, if, we're, if we know we're over that 155,000 asset limit and we've got a new diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's, that's the time to come in and meet. And then what we look at a lot of times is who do we trust to take care of our stuff? Who, who is that trusted person that could be a trustee? What if we wanted to set up a trust and move some assets over to a trust? Would it be one of my kids, a friend, brother, sister? Who could do that? because you can move things into an asset protection trust and then qualify for this VA aid and attendance pension three years later. Same thing with Medicaid. You could qualify five years later if you're you know, below those other asset limits. So um, some people qualify right away because they have um, their assets have been depleted by you know, the care that they've been providing already, okay? Um, on the next line, going back to um, the deficits and the things that VA covers. So another difference between VA and Medicaid is that VA, you can use this money for you know care at home. You can use this money for care in assisted living, care in a nursing home. So in that final box, what they deduct out of your monthly income to determine if you're eligible is health and dental insurance premiums and your sitter fees. They consider a sitter to be a medical expense. So don't think that just because that sitters come in here you know, cooking you meals, helping you bathe and dress, um, transporting them, um, helping with their hygiene after they've been toileting. Those are considered medical deductions for VA purposes. Some people say, well, that's not medical. Well, it is for VA purposes. <laughs> so that's what's important to, to realize. It might not be a nurse providing that care, but a CNA could provide it. A family member can provide it, not a spouse, but a daughter, a son, a cousin, niece or nephew, they can be provided, I mean, paid to provide that care. Okay, also nursing home fees, they even count incontinence supplies. So, you know, a lot of times incontinence is one of those issues you deal with, you know, even early in early and moderate times. And, you know, you can throw out about $100 a month on up right <laughs> each month so you know they look at that all they want on your application is basically to see okay here's my hundred dollars a month of incontinence, incontinence care my medicare premium is this my supplement is this vision care dental care um, my assisted living fees so it's kind of a, a lengthy va application okay so those are you know some of the qualifiers and what they cover um, you've got your war periods. I wanted to um, also discuss, I've got a checklist, which is next. Like there's one, um, the checkoff list for the items that you need to prevent, um, to apply for a veteran's claim. And then the next sheet is to uh, prepare a widowed spouse's claim. And so that's all the information that you need to collect in order to submit this. Um, the Department of Veterans Affairs is where you submit this, and they've really upgraded, especially with COVID. You can upload these documents online and submit it. We have local departments of Veterans Affairs. Um, there's one on Cresswell. There's one on Barksdale Boulevard. Um, if you're considering a move into the veterans home, they actually have somebody, someone that's there a couple days a week that helps submit these applications. Um, if we're working with someone and we're doing more of an asset protection thing and we're looking at VA in three years, we'll help someone. No one can charge you to do a VA application, okay? If they're helping you with it, it's just because they're kind hearted and you, they want you to qualify, okay? <laughs> so um, so I, I do have over here, if anybody's interested, um, the list of uh, Department of Veterans Affairs that you can go to. Um, anyway, so when it gets complicated is when you're trying to deal with um you know your loved one that you don't know where their records are okay and then that becomes a big um a mess right because if you're just jumping in and helping your mom it's like well where are dad's records i don't remember you know or things get lost at home they downsize they've thrown out a ton of stuff so um you can request those veterans records and also over there, I have um, 
on my sheet, hold on, step away from the video for a second. There is um, a website that you can go on to, it's the, um, the archives, the military archives, and that's listed right here. And it's basically, you would submit the information about the veteran, like as much information that you know, date of birth, social security number, um, <clears throat> potential uh, area where they served, um, and you're wanting to get this information for um, benefit information. So, and if you call me, I can help you work through these things. But um, sometimes people don't have their DD-214 or their separation papers, so they, they need to get on this to find out, okay, how can, how can we even see if we're eligible? Um, I did bring a few samples of the separation papers. So back in World War II, they just called them separation papers. Um, not until after World War II did you have a DD-214. So those may be a few things that you hear um, people talk about. Hey, you got your DD-214 and you look and look and look and you can't find it. Well, if it was World War II, they didn't have a DD-214. <laughs> so it would be more like this, honorable discharge, okay? And a lot of times these are two-sided pieces of information. Um, this particular person, <clears throat> when they got back, they were advised, hey, go, um, get this certified at your parish courthouse, you know, and that's a great thing because if you lose your records, go to the courthouse and see if maybe your dad or mom filed those. And on the back, they also have some information about, you know, the entry date, the exit date, when were they actually activated to active duty. So these are all important things for you to take either to the Department of Veterans Affairs or someone like me um, to figure out, are we within those acceptable war periods, okay? Um, so that's, this was a U.S. Navy discharge. Um, another one I got, let's see, this was one from the Army. That's another one, and that's what this one looks like. Um, and on the back of that, this one actually says DD-214 on it. And so you can see how there's so much information on this piece of paper that <laughs> sometimes it's hard to read. It's like... <clears throat> And then they kind of update the form, so it's like where they usually have um, activated active duty and the discharge, you know, have moved in the forms over the years. But um, again, what they're looking for is that 90 consecutive days during time of war. I mean, I've had people that have eked by that they entered the war at the very end. They may have had two days during wartime, but 90 days active. They qualified for the benefit, okay? I've had people that have missed it by days. Like they were, they came in after, you know, what they called the active war period, um, just by a couple of days. And that's just hugely disappointing. My friend did, my friend did that. Her husband died very soon after they married and mm -hmm. she didn't get 90 days, so she don't get nothing. Yeah, I know. It's super disappointing. Mm -hmm. But one thing with the veterans, even if they did not serve active duty during the wartime, they may still be eligible to go to the veteran's home if they need nursing home care. So that's something to look into. You may not qualify for that aid and attendance pension, but the veteran himself may still be able to go to the veteran's home. They no longer call it the Northwest Louisiana War Veterans Home. They changed the name to the Northwest Louisiana Veterans Home, okay? They took war out of there because there are many peacetime veterans that served active duty their entire um, career and you know, they are eligible to reside there. They're just not eligible for this extra pension, so. Is that, do you have to have a uh, service-related disability? No. I mean, this is just available. This is non-service connected pension. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, hmm. yeah. So it's basically, they're saying, if you're over 65 and disabled, and you were a veteran, mm -hmm. and served in active duty 90 days consecutive, you may be eligible for this then you have to show proof of that disability. What is that disability? The doctor has a four page form he has to fill out. Basically what I tell people is, when you go to the doctor, take a blank one, and then take one that you filled out for your loved one that shows, okay, he can't cook, I have to help him with ADLs, bathing, dressing. Why does he need help? Because he's falling. Because, because sometimes the doctor, when you go in to see him, their patient is sitting there. How are you doing? I'm fine. Mm -hmm. Have any problems? No. Okay, right? And so the spouse is there saying, oh, yeah, we're having problems. <laughs> you know, but they're like, okay. So they're not seeing what assistance they need. So if you go with your list and say, hey, doc, 
I've got this already filled out, but if you want to refill it out, I'm fine. What I need you to do is put down all the diagnoses. What is, what is it? My arthritis, my dementia, you know, these other things. Why do I need help bathing? Why do I need help? Well, at risk for falls, you had a stroke, you have vascular dementia, you, you know, have Parkinson's. Yeah, you're at risk for falls. I don't want you cooking. I don't want you in the shower by yourself. You know, these are things that don't come up until you ask them. <laughs> okay, so yeah, if you pre-fill out your forms, then the doctor's more likely just to flip through the file and add your diagnoses and a few other things, sign off, and there you go. Okay, because um, what they don't know, neither does the Department of Veterans Affairs know. <laughs> so if the doctor doesn't put it on the form that you need help with at least two ADLs, then the VA is gonna say, well, this person doesn't need assistance, right? Okay, so it's really important to, you know, educate your doctor or the nurse and say, these are the things we're having trouble with. Here's my form completed. And that's why I usually coach people on, okay, let's come in, you tell me what's wrong with your loved one. I'm gonna check this off, I'm gonna write these things down that sound professional and medically involved, and then we'll give it to the doctor to fill out and sign, okay? Um, is the aid in attendance additional to the pension or, in, or is it part of the pension? Yeah, it is part of the pension. Okay. Yeah, so there's a low income pension. If, you're pen, if your income is very low and you have very limited resources, um, it's called a house bound benefit. So that's the first part of the pension. And then it grows. If you need that aid and assistance of another person mm -hmm. to help stay at home or in the assisted living, then that's when they bump it up. So that's what those amounts are. That's the full amount that a veteran could get. Yeah. Um, Excuse me, now you said mm -hmm. um, two assistance with two ADLs mm -hmm. or cognitive impairment? Right, yeah, it's kind of like long-term care insurance. They have these different tracks. They say, okay, you have to be impaired in two out of these five ADLs in order to qualify, or your cognitive impairment has to be such that you require 24-hour care and the doctor has to certify that you're in a moderate to severe part of Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, whatever the diagnosis might be. So as long as the doctor certifies that, yeah, because that circles back to, would your loved one change their clothes every day if you did not prompt them? Would they take a shower? When they get in the shower, do they actually bathe or do they stand under the water? So these are all parts that the doctor doesn't know, right? Mm -hmm. So if if they can do the activity of showering, but they're not gonna get in it until you haul them to the shower and do it, they need supervision, they need hands-on care. So that actually is an impairment in the ADL, okay? So it's all in the wording, right? Also eating, do some of you have loved ones that just won't eat? unless you just put something right in front of them, even cut it up and remind them constantly, hey, we're eating, come on, let's come back and, and eat. Well, eating is very important. <laughs> so feeding is actually one of the you know ADLs. And it's usually if a meal is prepared and put in front of the veteran or the wife, can they manage the food? So anyone you know who had a stroke and needs food cut up and positioned frequently, that's automatically needing supervision. Sometimes with an Alzheimer's dementia, it's you've got to prepare it, put it in front of them. You know, that's assistance with feeding. They're not gonna feed unless you prompt and bring it to them. If they were left with you just calling and saying, hey honey, it's time to eat, are they gonna actually go to the fridge and figure out how to prepare that meal? No, that's an impairment in feeding, okay? So back to the service connected versus non-service connected. So aid in attendance has that pension level for non-service connected. The veterans home also has a benefit for people that have the service connected disability. You've got folks that were in Vietnam, exposed to Agent Orange, had strokes, had cancer, um, various things. A lot of times you see the bladder cancer, prostate cancer, stuff like that. Um, sometimes they start out with a low rating. You know, they might be 20% disabled and you know, have a, a very small income. Well, if they get to the point where they need the assistance of a person in the home, first, you can apply for aid in attendance because you can get this pension, 
but also that's a time that they need to look at getting a higher rating. Okay, so if they're 10% or 20% disabled, but now their cancer has progressed or they've got more vascular things going on, they've got the vascular dementia and they can go back to, um, to get another rating at the VA and they say, oh yeah, all these, these strokes and symptoms and everything are related to this disability from Vietnam. Yes, we're gonna bump you up to 100% disabled, 80% disabled. That's gonna increase their pension, but also if they needed nursing home care, they could go to the veteran's home and not have to pay a dime, okay? And that's a service-connected disability. So there's, you know, there's a couple different tracks there. And of course, the service-connected disability does have a little extra added on, you know, um, for the aid in attendance, but pretty much once they get 100% rated, you know, they're at, that high, they're at a higher pension rate than the single veteran, you know, $2,300 a month. So really, I think when they tack on a little extra, it's only a few hundred dollars extra a month. Same thing with a widow. If a widow is already receiving um, DIC income from their husband who was 100% rated at the time of his death, if they need aid in attendance later, they'll bump up that widow's compensation, adding the aid in attendance portion to it, but it's only a few hundred dollars extra a month. But you know what? A few hundred dollars extra a month covers medicines, diapers, you know, sitters for a few hours. I mean, it's all mm -hmm. nice to have these extra things, right? But you earned it, get it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and they earned it the day they went over and came back and were discharged and served active duty at least 90 days. So yeah, this was earned long ago. Anyway, let's see. So um, sometimes people use these in conjunction with long-term care insurance. Sometimes people have like a policy that might pay like $50 a day. Well, great. Go ahead and make your claim on that. Let's make a claim for VA aid in attendance to get a little extra help. And then at the point that somebody may need some nursing home care, then we're looking at, okay, what is the payer um, that will pay for larger portions? So if possibly it's a widow um, and she doesn't want to go to the veteran's home, then she might want to go to a local uh, uh, Medicaid nursing home which 98% of our nursing homes in Shreveport Bossier are Medicaid nursing homes, okay? They have private pay, long-term care insurance, Medicaid. So if she wanted to go there and she's already on this widow's benefit, once she spends down to $2,000 as a single applicant, she can get on Medicaid, okay? Her widow's pension through the VA would go away because it's pay or last resort, right? But what they have is a personal needs allowance that once she qualifies for Medicaid to help pay for her nursing home care, um, they say, well, your husband was a veteran and you get a $90 personal needs allowance. Medicaid allows $38. VA says, we're gonna pop in an extra $90 for you. So that's helpful because you know, $38 a month, you know, when you're in the nursing home and have no other money, what does that pay for? It pays for one pack of Depends and you know, if, you know, your clothes are ruined through the laundry or lost, people, you know, taking your stuff, they shrink, they bleach them, um, stuff gets lost. $38 a month doesn't pay for a new pair of shoes, right? So it's nice to have that extra $90 that, that can help. Uh, let's see, what else? Do you guys have some questions? I would like to know what your last name is. It is Rec, mm -hmm. R-E-C-H. And I've got cards over there with my phone number. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's wreck, but you can mm -hmm. call me wreck. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> wreck. Wreck like tech. Sounds like car wreck. Vicki, have you got a lot of experience with people talking about the veteran home here, mm -hmm. what their opinion is about it? Or anything? Yeah, I mean, if you go on medicare.gov yeah. online, it's one of the highest rated Medicare facilities. Really? Yeah, it is in Louisiana. So it's got a very good rating. Mm -hmm. Any nursing home is only as good as the people that are working there, right? Mm -hmm. But the family members that are going to check on their loved one, the more you're there and you know they see that you're involved and are concerned about care, the more you go to care planning meetings, you're gonna have a better experience with the nursing home. Mm -hmm. When somebody is admitted to a nursing home, they always get the patient, um, responsibility guide and you know their little protective acts and things like that and you always know if you are having issues with a nursing home first you talk to the person that's involved and then you talk to the nurse over that person who's involved then you go to the administrator 
but we also have advocates locally through Council on Aging, okay? So you can go to that next step. Hey, I need you to come in and you know be my advocate because I don't think we're getting quality care, right? And so it's just being the advocate for your person and making sure that you know their care is quality. So what else can you guys think of? If you want to talk a little bit about Medicaid, that's on the other side of the table. We've got a few more minutes. Um, again, we, we look at these benefits as just kind of dovetailing because we found when we were doing Medicaid planning years and years ago, it's like you find out people coming in, are you a veteran? Yeah, are you a veteran? I'm a widow of a veteran. You know, so many people were like, okay, well, there's this little known um, benefit called aid in attendance that they don't tell you about when you're discharged from the service. Well, in the first place, you're not elderly and in need of care. <laughs> so it's just, you're looking more at getting a VA loan for your house or going for education and stuff like that. But this is just something that's been around for many years and is being you know accessed. So we always look at these two pools of money as how can these benefits help our clients? So we, what we wanna do is we wanna access whichever government um, benefit is available. The veteran's home is not a Medicaid facility. They do allow spouses of veterans to live there. Um, and if the spouse is a female, they have to wait till there's either another female available. They only have shared rooms, okay? Um, but if, um, if the veteran and his spouse go in at the same time, of course they can share a room, right? So um, the veteran has their particular fee for going, and usually it's around the aid and attendance amount, about $1,900 to $2,000 a month is what the veteran pays. But a spouse of a veteran, I think the current rate is about five thousand dollars a month, and that you know that does go up a little bit each year. Just like when you're looking at a Medicaid facility, you're looking at it could be anywhere from fifty five hundred on up to eight thousand dollars a month that you're paying in a nursing home. So if you don't have long term care insurance, Medicaid and VA benefits could be your long term care insurance. Okay. Um, again, some other things that you want to look at is you know who do you have trusted at home that can help take care of these things with you okay so you being the provider of care for your loved one are your kids there to help you are can you trust your kids to help take care of some of these assets for you for the long term what we want to do is stretch your dollars so they outlast you okay and that that we can also um, gain a veteran or a medicaid benefit you know and stretch your dollars so um, again with the with medicaid you know, if, you're, um, if your spouse needs nursing home care, they basically they look at both your incomes, they look at your resources together, even if you have separate property that's inherited or if you have a separate property regime, they don't care, you're a community, so they just look at you together. So on that column, the exempt assets are the same as the VA benefit, okay? And then the asset limits, for a single applicant, you basically have to be down to $2,000 and that's just your resources that you can have. Income is the next thing. Um, we're a medically needy spend down state, so you can actually get on Medicaid in the nursing home even if your income is above $1,000 a month, okay? Because basically your income or the income of the claimant is your copay. Um, if, if it's the husband that's going in the nursing home and he has a higher income, they also look at the community spouse at home. What is their income? And Medicaid will allow that spouse at home to keep up to $3,800, $3,853 of the community income, okay? So if you're a low-income low lady and your spouse has all the income and you have $500 a month, well, Medicaid's going to say, well, your husband doesn't have to pay all his money to the nursing home each month. They're going to let you keep up to $3,800 worth of your combined income each month, okay? Because they realize you have a household to take care of. You have your own needs to take care of. You don't both have to be down to two thousand dollars to qualify, okay? Um, so, and that's why they ask for the income for both spouses because they're like they want to make sure that community spouse is taken care of. They don't need two people on public benefits at one time. They want to make sure you've got something that you can um, have take care of you for your lifetime. If you've got separate community property, like a prenup or something like that, mm -hmm. do they recognize that? Well, they do, but they. Um, um, I mean, they realize that you have it, so upon your death, they don't they don't think that it has to go back to the you know claimant in the nursing home, you know your will. But they do look at your property. They say you're a community. 
So whether you have a separate property regime or not, they look at if you've got money, he's got money, and it's separate, they still wanna know what is everything together, okay? So the asset limit for Medicaid is 154,140. So they don't, although they recognize that you have separate property regime, they say it doesn't matter because we have to look at who's in the household. So who's in that household applying for Medicaid? The claimant in the nursing home and then the community spouse. So having you know, inherited property or a separate property regime is great. It's just a matter of when you're planning for future catastrophic care needs, you want to look at, oh, I realize that my you know, acreage down there in Natchitoches Parish is going to put us over the limit, and I need to do something with that. Because land is important, especially in Louisiana. A lot of times when people have money, it's sitting in dirt, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> or oil and gas royalties. Mm -hmm. And that's something you want to pass on to your kids. That's something that your parents or your grandparents you know, gave to you. And so it, it's important to families. And if it's important to you, it's important to protect it and to think, okay, now we have a new diagnosis of dementia. We really need to look at how can we get this property to stay in our family name and apply for Medicaid later. So that's when we look at that five year look back. Okay, we, we look at, we've got a new diagnosis. It's time to go talk to an elder law attorney and figure out get our documents in place, let's find out when we can qualify for these benefits, okay? Sometimes we can't do anything. We may have large, large, large IRAs or something, you know, it's like, well, if you have the cash to fund your care, then that's your long-term care plan. You know, you've got a million dollars in IRAs. Well, you know, you don't wanna cash those out to give them away because <laughs> you're gonna pay half of it in tax. But um, that's why it's, you know, important to really get with an expert and figure out, you know, what, what can be covered and, you know, what you can do in planning. So, Vicki, who values your, your property? Do they just take your word for it that it's worth X amount or how do they determine? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you're required to turn in bank statements, financial statements, report what's ever in your safety deposit box. When it comes to land that's not your home, then they do require either an appraisal from a licensed appraiser mm -hmm. or a real estate broker. You can't just take real estate comps and say, oh, you know, this real estate agent ran this for me in Natchitoches Parish, my 80 acres, and they say it's worth this. No, it has to be a licensed real estate broker because they can give you a fair market value opinion mm -hmm. or actually an appraiser that goes out there, walks your land, and gives you that 20-page report. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. A lot of times we're dealing with undivided property in Louisiana. We've got people who never finished successions from two generations ago and said, so, well, I own 120th of 500 acres. It's like, well, they still need to know what is that 120th of 500 worth? Mm -hmm. Because does it put you over the asset limit or not? Well, I'm sure it doesn't put me over the asset limit. Well, you have to get the figures. <laughs> you have to provide them the information. That's why when people come to us, we're like, okay, let's get an assessment on this. Let's get an appraisal. Let's figure it out. Undivided property is hard to get rid of. So the value is really less than it would be if you owned 100% of that. So Medicaid allows a valuation that is less, usually up to 25%, because nobody wants to buy into a piece of property with you and 12 other people. What, you know, how does that help them? No, now if it was just you and this person, they're like, yeah, I'll buy into that, but I'm not gonna buy into this 20 acres with 30 people. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make sense. I mean, they just wanna buy it all out, right? So that, that brings your value of your land down, which is good for Medicaid purposes <laughs> and VA purposes, right? Yeah, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. What other questions do you guys have? What about widow's pension? If the mm -hmm. widow didn't know she was eligible for this and then applied mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. her husband served in Vietnam the 90 mm -hmm. days and so forth, is mm -hmm. there back pay for that? Mm -hmm. um, the back pay only retros back to the data application. Okay. okay, so if if um, if the veteran was 100% disabled before death, then the Department of Veterans Affairs would help that widow apply for DIC for that continued benefit. And there are you know rules about how long they had to be married, how long he had to be 100% disabled to mm -hmm. get that DIC. But if it's a non-service connected pension. Um, they will retro it back to his death if she was otherwise eligible. So if she was low income mm -hmm. and her assets were low enough, when he died and she just finds out about it up to a year later, they will retro back and pay that whole year. Okay. Now if it's something like she, he died and then two, three, four years later she finds out about it, but she didn't need assistance until that 
three, four, five years later, they're not going to retro back to his death. They're just going to, you know, uh, when she's eligible medically and financially is when they would lock in that date. Basically, when you turn in an application, either if you upload it or send it up to Milwaukee, because that's our pension management center, or you go to one of the local people to help you, um, they lock in the first of the month after you apply. So if I'm applying for, you know, May 1st, I would have had to submit it anytime up to April 30th, okay? They stamp it, they'll retro it back. It takes them about three to six months to process the application. So if I get my stuff in on April 30th, they're going to lock in May 1st. And then once they get all their information, ask me for a few things, maybe I forgot a death certificate or something like that, then they ask, you know, let me get this stuff. And then they'll say, okay, yeah, you're eligible and you submitted your stuff for May 1st. We're gonna pay this 1400 a month. You're gonna get one lump sum payment and then we're gonna pay you the 1478 per month. You have to give them your bank account information, drop that in. A lot of times when you're dealing with people with dementia on the doctor's form and ask, do you think that you were claimant can manage their own affairs. Because sometimes you can have dementia and still understand money. The more severe it gets, that's a less common occurrence. But when VA sees dementia, memory problems, Alzheimer's on their forms, then they probably want to appoint a fiduciary for that person because they think, I don't think I want to give a lump sum of $10,000 to a veteran who has dementia, right? So I want to see who in that family can be the fiduciary? So there's more forms to fill out. VA doesn't recognize power of attorney. Also, you know, Social Security Administration doesn't. You can't just send your stuff and say, hey, send me all my stuff for my husband's Social Security. They're like, mm, we don't recognize that. You, know, you have to be appointed as a representative payee. Same thing with VA. So if they say, well, you know, your loved one has dementia, we want to appoint a fiduciary, then you just simply have them sign a form. I want to appoint my spouse as my fiduciary. Here's the information. Or I want to appoint my son, my daughter, and VA will consider that. And what they do is basically just a background check and a credit check and, a, uh, and an interview with you. Just make sure that, yeah, you are competent and able to manage someone else's money. I mean, they'll find out if this person's bankrupt or has, you know, been in jail or whatever. I mean, they do background checks, which is important because can you imagine your husband getting a lump sum payment and some shyster walks away with $10,000? I mean, that would be terrible. So, so that's really important, that fiduciary part of it. And then if a fiduciary is appointed um, every year, they do have to do like an annual accounting, just like you have to do for Social Security if you're the representative payee for them. And it's not difficult. Basically, you say, mom got this $1,478 a month. Her assisted living fees each month were $2,500. So in, out. That's all you have to do is report how that VA money was spent. You don't have to report how her Social Security and pension was spent. Just her VA money, okay? What other questions do you guys have? A lot of information to cover. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they need to get information from you and not their neighbor, because every situation is different mm -hmm. based mm -hmm. on how long they serve, all that stuff. Right, mm -hmm. That's only, that's true. We find in a lot of ways, you know, you have people that are just shaking in their boots. Mom's going to the nursing home. They told her that she makes too much money and she'll never qualify for Medicaid. Absolutely untrue. <laughs> I don't know how many times I have to say, no, she will qualify and I'll help her. It's not a problem. It's just, you know, there's different levels of Medicaid benefits. There's health care. There's Medicaid for long-term care. You know, there's in-home care. So, you know, one program does not always dictate the other program rules. So you're absolutely right. If your neighbor says, oh, this is what I did. Well, that was good for them and their family situation is not always good for you. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, we do have clients that, you know, hundred percent can trust their kids. They're great kids because they raised them and they are very, you know, they all have good paying jobs. They can take care of things. And then there's some that haven't been blessed. You know, you have people that have black sheep in the family and it's like they either, you know, have scraped, you know, from day to day, drug problems, alcohol problems, uh, divorce, their wife took them to the cleaners or something. You just can't trust them to take care of your stuff. It's like, well, I know you love them, but why don't you pick a different kid to help you take care of stuff? Let this one maybe make your healthcare decisions, but let this one that knows how to manage a bank account, let them be over your VA money. <laughs> 
I know you love your kids, but it's like you can't risk everything you've earned just because you don't want to hurt their feelings. Yeah, you need you know, somebody that you can trust to help take care of you. So I do have um, these extra handouts over there, you know, that has the, um, the local departments of veterans affairs. It's got the um, uh, line here for requesting your veterans records um, and how to apply online. We always say, you know, just make sure that when you're applying for something, always keep a copy of the application. And if you're sending it to Milwaukee by the paper, send it certified and keep a copy of that certification. Because sometimes they'll come back and go, okay, well, you, uh, you applied, you know that you locked in May 1st, but by the time they got all their paperwork, it's December 31st. And like, okay, well, you qualify for January. It's like, oh no, look at this. I sent an uh, intent to file a claim. Here's a certified mail receipt that you guys signed up there in Milwaukee. You knew that I was applying you know, for May 1st. So then they'll retro it back. So if you don't keep your receipts and you don't keep all this proof, then it, did it really happen? If they lost it, then it didn't happen, right? Mm -hmm. So always keep those. Also remember, um, they don't recognize power of attorney. It takes them three to six months to process those. So sometimes I've had folks that it's like their kids will loan them money to pay for sitters um, up until the time that VA will start giving them some money to help them. Um, because really, you know, unless you have that medical expense, VA doesn't see that you need that money for sitters. So if you're just scraping by, you know, you need to be able to pay somebody to help you to have that medical expense. All right, any other questions? I have a question. Uh-huh. Uh, and it doesn't relate to the VA thing. Okay. <clears throat> My wife has dementia. Uh-huh. She can't take care of any of her affairs. Uh -huh. So I take care of all of it. Mm -hmm. I was advised by an attorney to do an interdiction on her. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I do have a power of attorney for her. Her social security check and, and a small pension check go into a joint account that we have. Mm -hmm. But do I really need an interdiction on her? Well, it depends. Did you do one? No. Okay, then if that power of attorney is working, then you're okay. Okay. As long as it allows you to do everything you need, it includes financial and health care. Okay, yeah. Sometimes people have trouble with power of attorney if it doesn't include something. So that's when, if you're trying to sell some real estate, and a title attorney says, well, your power of attorney doesn't allow you to do that. <clears throat> well, if your wife's not able to sign that deed or sign, is not competent to sign a new power of attorney, that's when you would need to interdict her. Or say you needed to admit her to a nursing home and she refuses and they say well unless you interdict her we can't make her stay right that's when you need to do an interdiction yeah um yeah i we had a case where um this fella did an interdiction because um i mean and it's important i mean we want people to keep their rights forever right and we, <laughs> we want to do the least invasive thing but sometimes you just have to and his wife had gotten to the point with her dementia that she couldn't sign for him. She couldn't sign her name. She didn't really know what she was signing and she really didn't know who he was. So he did have to interdict her. And that's why it's really important to get that power of attorney in place when you have a new diagnosis, because a new diagnosis does not mean that that person doesn't know who you are and doesn't want you taking care of their affairs, right? They may be a little agitated about some things, but you know, they married you <laughs> and they want you to take care of things. So um, that's why we always encourage, I know they probably don't wanna sign something, but if they really understand it's just gonna sit here in a drawer until you need it, that's why it's important to have that sitting there. But um, unless there was some other reason that you needed something else done, um, sometimes banks have you know, specific language they want to see in the power of attorney and um, and it's not in yours and they'll, they won't let you manage that. Um, at time, different brokerage firms will ask you to sign their own specific power of attorney form. Um, I think there's just been so many cases of elder abuse financially that banks and financial institutions are just scared of dealing with someone which is a vague power of attorney. So those would be instances when you would need to you know, do an interdiction. Yeah. 